And uh, so that way we'll have a record of this for those who want to watch later. So go ahead. Okay, let, me know, let me know when the recording has started, please. It started. Okay, so I know you know this, but for the recording, I'm just gonna say I'm Wanda Honeycutt. And just a very little bit about my background, because I know it's, it's really boring to come to a class or workshop or demo and, and have the artists go on and on about themselves. So just a couple of minutes. And I started um, doing art in college and I took a couple of classes, but I knew I couldn't make a living doing that. So I became an occupational therapist and that's what I took in college. And I did that for 30 years. So in between college and 2009, I really didn't do much art and I had children and you know how that goes. So um, when the kids left and I retired, then I started painting and then I've just been painting like crazy ever since then. And I'm a member of the San Diego Watercolor Society. I know some of you from there and I've been there for five, maybe six years, I'm not sure. And I have uh, paintings in the show just about every time I've been like super lucky. And I love it there. I'm a volunteer. Some settings. There. Where do you go? Somebody was Anne, saying something. Anne, can you mute yourself? I'll mute everybody. <laughs> the man's in control. Okay. And we have a mute. We can't hear Wanda. Uh, all right, now I am. Nope. Sorry. I hit unmute. Now okay. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Okay, good. So today we're going to do watercolor on UPO paper. And I say paper loosely because really it's a piece of plastic. That's what UPO is, is plastic. It's synthetic and it just does all kinds of unusual things, wonderful things and sometimes very challenging things. I have so many times people say, I tried UPO and I give up and it's like finger painting and the paint just rolls around and I can't control it. And you know, all of that is true. It can, be, it can be very challenging, but I've played with it a lot and I've um, develop, developed what I think maybe are some unique things that I'm gonna teach you today about what to do with certain tools and even brushes and uh, my fingers and who knows what. Um, I'm a very experimental and I think courageous painter because I'll try just about anything. And it's just a piece of, in this case, plastic and paint. So I really like to explore and I'm also an intuitive painter. So I just really go by my gut feeling about a painting. I will be going on the painting and I just will get an intuition. Let's see, I'm, do I want red or do I want green? And my gut feeling will go red. And it's, it's more of a feeling and I'll be talking about that more as we go along because I'm just gonna be thinking out loud as I paint. So we have three demos and, um, or three sections and yeah, you know, three demos also. So right now I'm going to talk a little bit about composition. And I know you just had Kathleen Scoggin and she's fabulous. She is the queen of composition. She's the queen of abstract art. And that's what I'm going to be doing is non-representational abstract today. However, you're going to be able to use what I teach you in your representational pieces. So you can, there is a crossover. So I'm going to go to my uh, whiteboard here and talk a little bit about composition. So Kath, uh, here's your, here's um, a paint, a uh, piece of paper. And you probably have heard this a thousand times, but I'm just going to go over it again, because I think it bears repeating that uh, center of interest or focal point. If you put that center of interest or focal point in this, one of these areas, those are what I call the sweet spots. And the, that will be do so much for helping you to have a great painting. So that is something even in, in my non-representational abstracts, and even if I do them all intuitively, I will still have that in the back of my mind about where my focal point is going to be. So I think that's one of the prime things. And I'll be talking more about how to create a focal point, what makes a focal point, and that kind of thing. So, 
um, I'm going to show you now some compositions, different compositions. I have a question for you, Wanda. So you're, sure. talking, you're talking about being a very intuitive painter. Uh, does right. that mean that you're not afraid to throw something away after you've done it? Or, of course, if you're, well, you work on Yupo, you can just wipe it off, I suppose. Exactly, exactly. And to tell you the truth, I don't throw much away. Um, I will work on a painting, even if it means putting gesso over three quarters of it. So I don't tend to throw things away, but I also will change something a lot. Can you guys see me now, or are you seeing pictures? We see you. Okay, good. So I, because <laughs> I'm seeing just pictures, but you can see oh, me. We see good. you. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So. And even and with this UPO, I'm going to be telling you that I will take out more than I put in. And that is even true uh, with my paintings, my other paintings too. Not that I'm going to take out more, but I do give things up that aren't working. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't do. They're afraid to. They get something really magnificent and it's right smack dab in the middle of their painting and they just want to keep it. And it just doesn't work um, for making a great painting if it's in the wrong place. So I will get rid of stuff. And I'm loading some paintings on here now that I want to show you. So are you seeing a painting there now? Yes. Great. So this is not on you, Poe, but it's just a, uh, uh, one of my paintings that I did. And it's uh, representative of a composition called Radiating from a Central Core. And you can see that this is the focal point, And then we've got all this stuff coming in towards that central core. Kathleen Scoggin is so good at this. She had one last month that sold that was just brilliant about that. So that's radiating from a central core. Whoops. And this is the one you guys were talking about that's in the Watercolor Society right now. And this can be a couple of different compositions. It's a cruciform a cross shape, but it's also radiating from a central core. So you have that focal point and everything is leading the viewer's eye right up to that focal point. This is another radiating from a central core that I just finished. I started this in one of my classes this summer workshops and then I um, kept working on it. And uh, this one hasn't been in the show yet. Is this on UPO? Yeah, all these are, I'm sorry, all the, that's UPO. All the rest are going to be UPO. Yeah. This is another one I did in my class. Another one that's um, cruciform and radiating from a central core. And those two can easily be combined. I often combine those two compositional elements. Um, while this is up here, let me just uh, talk about this area and this area in particular are quieter areas than the rest of the painting. Yupo tends to get super busy. You can get Yupo um, busy without even trying. So these, these, this area here and here where I'm putting those X's, I have toned down with a roller. So I'm pretty sure I will remember to tell you that, but if I don't, remind me. Because so toning down is as important as dialing up. So while the, while the watercolor is still wet, you go over it with a roller? Well, I'm going to show you because okay. it's tricky. Water, it, it can be somewhat damp, but, but it also, you'll get all different kinds of things depending on whether it's, it's damp or, um, or dry or, or whatever. So different, different times. Okay, so this is, um, let me show you the completed painting first. We've got these out of order here. This is the completed painting, and this is a uh, one third, two thirds. And I tend to put my um, focal points too high. It's just kind of, uh, I don't know. It's just something I, I have a um, hard time with. So this is almost like one quarter, uh, three quarters, but it still works composition, compos compositionally, I think. And this started out like this. And this is, this is gonna be the first paint, uh, part of our painting today, minus the line, black lines. This is an underpainting and then after the underpainting, then I put a drawing on top. And then, and there's the drawing that I did. And this is what I did the drawing from. And I think I wanted to definitely tell you about this. When I took a Kathleen Scoggin class a while back, she talked about using cracks in rocks. 
as um, a good composition, a way to do a, a drawing and a composition. And when I was out walking, I noticed all these cracks in the asphalt. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's like such a good composition. So I took all these pictures of these cracks in the sidewalk. And then that's what um, I did this drawing from. So that's what you saw on that. Okay. And then I think I have a, oh, this is a painting in the, in the middle. And that is before I did all the final refinements on it. And I have to say the painting that I, I'm going to do for you today may not be finished. It may not look good, but I, the, my main thing is that I want to show you all of the elements that you can use in your paintings. And that's, that's my objective. So I think I've shown you the three compositions. There's one third, two third. Radi oh, this is another radiating from a central core. This is one of mine. And there's a focal point and everything going to it. And it's also a cruciform. And there's another one. There's another cruciform. This painting, you know, I look back on it now. I did this maybe three, four years ago. And it did really well. It got an award and it sold. But I look at that now. And for me, I think it's a little busy in those corners. So I think I would do it a little different. But it also has some really fun elements here. And all of these um, things here, like that's a stencil. Let me move this down so I can see. Stencil, 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 stencil. And what we're going to be doing, I'll show you how to use the stencils to wipe out shapes and also to add shapes by using a uh, dabber. So, okay. So that's it. I promise I wouldn't do too much on composition because I think you guys have probably had a lot of that. Oh, Ralph, did you, you must have pinned me since everybody can still see me, right? I haven't pinned you yet because you haven't gone to your, your painting area. I was going to do oh, okay. that. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So that sounds good. So let me just see if there's anything else I was going to tell you now. Uh, oh, yeah. Really important. Um, Okay, I was gonna actually do that in the next part, but I'll talk about it now. It's good to choose right from the beginning whether you want a warm painting or predominantly warm or predominantly cool. If you can't decide, just start painting. It's always good if you can't decide, you don't know what to do, just start painting. And, and you know, you can't, you, that's, you just gotta get started. But at some point you're gonna to have to decide, or you know, it's not a hard and fast rule, but your painting, I believe, will be more successful if you do predominantly warm and predominantly cool. And I got a very hard lesson about that because um, years ago I entered into the international show and I, ha and I didn't get any paintings in and I was um, uh, lucky enough to be able to talk to the juror and show him my paintings on my phone. And I said, could you just maybe critique this just for a couple of minutes? And he said, well, I wouldn't even have looked at that painting because it wasn't predominantly warm or predominantly cool. So there you go. If you're going to even it's, it's, you know, do it because it's pleasing because our human eye just likes that better. I don't know why, but also it'll help you to get into shows. Okay. It, yeah. did, did the juror think that, that your painting was too schizophrenic, that it, it basically couldn't decide where it wanted to go and, and, Therefore, it wasn't worthy of consideration. Sometimes people think I'm schizophrenic when they look at my paintings. I've had comments like, what were you smoking? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, um, or people say, I just like to be in your brain for just a little while. And I go, you might be scared. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think of you, po Okay, so why you, po? One thing that's great about you, po is that you can wipe you pull off. And, you know, that gives us so much freedom. So many times we're afraid to make a mistake or we can't change things or whatever. You can wipe it off with a paper towel or some Mr. Clean Magic Eraser, anything you do on there practically, except for acrylic. But watercolor wise, you can do that. And then I've, I've talked about some of the challenges with it. Um, but it does things that no other medium can do. It'll ooze and flow like no other medium. And it gets vibrant colors like no other medium. It has surprises like no other medium. So 
for those things, I love it. And I don't care about the challenges. And I've, um, I'm going to teach you ways to kind of corral some of those challenges. Okay. Now, questions. The one, the one uh, painting that you showed us before with, that you said uh, seemed to be kind of busy from three or four years ago, one thing that struck me there was uh, some teachers have taught us about uh, the uh, mama bear and papa bear and baby bear sort of concept and so forth. And it seemed like a lot of the elements in that were the same size. Uh, right. Right. And I think that was one of the problems with that painting, in my opinion. But like I said, the juror gave it an award and it sold. So even though it had those problems, it, it did well. But I agree with you, Ralph. I think there was too many of the same size and I would do things differently now. I've learned a lot since then. Yeah. Anybody else? Could you tell us the names of a couple of your paintings? That might give us a little insight into your brain. Great. <laughs> how it's working. <laughs> oh, uh, if I can remember, let's see. <laughs> they all have some crazy names, so I'm not sure if I can remember. Um, does anybody know the name of the one that's there now at the Watercolor Society? Okay. Oh, I don't want that. Uh, Oh boy, this is something about evolution or evolving or, I can't remember, sorry. I don't know if I can remember these. This was, Wanda, uh, what? Um, so when you enter uh, paintings in the San Diego Watercolor Society, do you try and follow their theme with your name and do you think that helps in the selection <laughs> or do you just randomly put in what you're ready to put in? Um, that last thing, just randomly put in. If I have a painting that fits with the theme, then I will submit that, possibly if I think it's a strong painting, but typically I don't go by that. And as far as the jurors go, I think that they, of course, best of theme is going to, um, it's going to have a lot of weight if, they, if it goes with the theme, of course. And then the other awards, it just depends on the juror, but I'm guessing 80% of them don't look at it that much. They're looking for good paintings. Okay, thank you. This is, I think, uh, what was, is this linear convergence of, uh, I don't know, I give them such crazy names. You guys can go on my website and I, I don't know the names aren't there either. How about if I, um, uh, Wanda, this is Rebecca, I have a question too about names. You know, okay. I've heard from some people, they say, oh, you should have your theme, your name, your title right from the start. And then that directs your painting. You Could ever be. Do that? Mm, not all. No, not always. It's all variable. It's all over. All over the board with me. But sometimes I like to name it kind of mid painting. I probably would never name it in the beginning because I'm such an intuitive painter. I don't know yeah. what it's going to say until I get into it a bit. But sometimes if I, um, yeah, sometimes I'll name it in the kind of mid painting. Yeah. Thank you. Anyway, this is like linear convergence. I think maybe that's just all it was, linear convergence. And don't remember. Uh, oh, geez. I'm not doing too good about remembering. Oh. Put it on your slides. <laughs> What's that? You can title it's each it, of your pictures. I'm sorry. Oh, you could put a title on your picture when you put it in. Yeah, it. that's that would yeah. be a good idea, right? So this one is called Canyon Dreams. This was my latest one, so I do remember this. Yeah, and I would go and look for it now, except that we have so much to cover that I don't want to um, take your time with that. But uh, let's move on. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So are we moving on? Yes. Demo time. Yes. Okay. Please. All right. So. Um, I just have to move my stand here with my iPad up onto a trunk. And that just takes a second here, so. Okay. 
How are we doing, Ralph? I just pinned your view now to the, uh, so that we've got you, your, your painting area is gonna be the main part of the screen. And I'm missing the part, I've got the uh, smiley face, the star and the square, but I don't see the other side of the. Okay, let me move back just a hair. How's that? Uh, could move, uh, move the triangle down just a little to the, whoop, not that to way. Me? Towards the other way? The, no, the other way. 90 degrees to that. There. There? But actually move up, move the other direction now. Farther up, up, up. There. That, there? That, all, all the tabs in there, yeah. Okay, good. You know what, I um, don't have my glass of water here. I have to go grab that real quick. Hang on. <laughs> So great being in my studio and my house. I can grab whatever I need. Okay. So normally I start out with just a white piece of paper, but last night when I was uh, filling out my palette, I got some red paint um, that was spilling out into my palette that I didn't want. So I scraped it up with a palette knife and I thought, I'm gonna waste this paint. And I knew I was gonna do a warm painting today. So I just slapped it on there. So. I don't know how this is going to go. And you'll hear me say that a lot today. I don't know how this is going to go. And that's what I do. That's how I paint. I don't know how it's going to go, but I'm going to experiment and see because I just love that joy of experimentation and discovery. And I, I just get so excited by it. And I've just, like I said, painted with the craziest things and you'll see me paint with some crazy things today. And I also have this uh, little blue mark here because like I said, I struggle with, with um, getting my focal point in the right place, even though I know where it goes. I get so caught up in painting that sometimes I just, it doesn't go there. So I don't know if that's gonna help me or not. That's an experiment. And we're gonna have lots of those today. So, okay, um, Katie, I'm saying lots of so, so you'll just have to forgive me. <laughs> Katie and I were Toastmasters. And they're doing so all the time, not the best thing in the world to do. But. Oh, Wanda, one thing you didn't mention yet, and I mentioned to a couple people about UPO, that you don't want to handle the stuff with your bare oh, fingers yes. because of the oil on your hands. Thank you very much. That's really a good point. And I used to concern myself with that a lot more, but I have a really quick, easy fix for that. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you, but it's better just not to do that. But if you do, there's an easy fix. But some things will get on there that make a resist that are really cool. I had that happen years ago with a painting. I have no idea what made that resist, but it looked like this glorious feather all across my painting. And I just went, whoa, and I've tried to recreate that. Um, and I never have been able to do it. So that was just a wonderful, happy surprise. Okay, this is the Jill Ritter color wheel. And I have never found a color wheel that is as good as this one, in my opinion. It's J-I-L-L-R-I-D-D-E-R. -L -L -E and this is on my supply list. So all of you guys have this. And the reason I like this is because you, you decide uh, what you want in terms of colors and you put your, this big part of this color wheel on the colors that you want to be dominant in your painting. In my case, I want warm colors. I want a lot of red and orange and gold. I've already discovered that. So I can use all of these colors in the main part of the painting. And then these smaller little circles and in this little cup shape thing are gonna be the accent colors. They're called discords and complements. And these are gonna go in the focal point if they're used full strength. And if they're muted down, they can be in other parts of the painting. I have found this to be extremely useful. And what I do is I like to do uh, blue, blue, green and turquoise. So I make sure that that little discord shows up in the color that I wanna use. And then I, and because it's so important to me, I can't live without turquoise basically. So it's gotta be in, if I know that I'm, I can't live without turquoise, I'm just gonna put that little thing there. So there's that. Okay. Oh, it's painting time. This is my palette. It's on my supply list, John Pike. 
big well palette. And it gives me lots of space because here's the lid and then I have this big space here to paint on and with. All of my paints are nice and wet and juicy. I've either squeezed them out yesterday or I have wet them down overnight and let them get nice and juicy. It's so important to have nice juicy paint so you don't have to be scrubbing on your paint. I also will just squeeze paint right out onto my Yupo sometimes, depending on how much patience or passion I have with what I'm doing. In this beginning part of the, oh, one more palette. This is my black palette. It's just a little travel palette and I have it specifically for blacks. I don't even use all those colors in there unless I am traveling, but I have alizarin crimson, permanent alizarin crimson, because alizarin crimson is very rogue, meaning that it will fade in the light, and phthalo green and phthalo blue. There's also another color that you can use instead of alizarin crimson. It's called, and it's not as rogue, it's payroll, I don't know how to pronounce that, P-E-R-Y-L-E-N-E, -E -E, maroon. M-A-R-O-O-N by Daniel Smith. That is, is more light fast. So you can use that in the place of a lizard and crimson. Oh, let me get my paper on here. I almost feel like I'm about ready to embark on a Disneyland ride or something. I get so excited when I paint. <laughs> Okay. Wanda, this is Rebecca. Do you have a preferred brand of watercolors that you use? You can't go wrong with Daniel Smith, but I also use American Journey with, uh, by uh, Cheap Joe's. But I'm not going to use them much anymore because it's just so hard to order from them. It takes so long. That's why I'm, I'm transitioning away from them. But Daniel Smith, you can't go wrong with. Also, this new one, it's uh, Aqua, uh, I can't say this, it's so hard to say, Aquarell. And uh, I love this Aquarell, uh, L-A-S-U-R-O-R-A-N-G-E. And I have this on my supply list, so you can, you can see it there. And for inexpensive paint, I also like Da Vinci. So there you have it. Okay. When you're starting this phase of the painting, I highly recommend, I can't say this enough, only two or three colors and make them all warm or all cool. I'll say it again, two or three colors, all warm or all cool. Because the more I say, even though I say that, people combine them all and then, then it's harder. And an, if you want to use a neutral, you can too. And I think the neutral, neutral that I thought about today was sepia. I may or may not use that, but I am going to use my Dari Light Yellow, which I can't live without, especially on Yupo, and that's on the supply list. The uh, Quinacridone Burnt Scarlet may not be on the supply, supply list. It's an American Journey color, but I really love that too. And I have the American Journey color Red Hot Mama, which has been one of my favorite colors for a long time, but since I'm trying to transition away from them, and not because they're not good paints, they're great paints, but they're just too hard to order from. I have found this Daniel Smith Pyrrole Scarlet, P-Y-R-R-O-L Scarlet. So that is a nice substitute. I'm gonna squeeze those right out. I'm not gonna use that American Journey. Mm, it's not, uh, it's gonna be difficult to get out of there. I have this teeny tiny little tube I got from Amazon. I didn't realize it was gonna be that tiny. Oh my gosh, I just, this is what I say about intuitive. I put that paint on there and I go, oh, yes, oh my gosh. I love that color. And I'm gonna put my Quinn Burnt Scarlet on there as well. Doesn't too, too much to me emotionally at this point, but when I put water to it, I think it will. And then my Diary Light Yellow, which I'm not gonna to use too much of that probably. I'm not sure I would even use that at this stage, but I really want to show you guys what that does in wet watercolor because it's pretty exciting. My favorite brush is on the supply list and I can't, 
I cannot read it because I've got so much paint on it. So you just have to look at the supply list. I think it's Heritage. And I don't know the number, but it's a one and a half inch brush. I use it for both acrylics and for watercolor. It, it just snap, it just cleans well. It's so durable. I'm really hard on my brushes. If I forget and leave it in the water for two days, it's, it's so forgiving. I just love it. And it covers a lot of territory. So Princeton in Heritage. First, what's that? Princeton Heritage is what it is. Okay, Princeton heard. Heritage, thanks. In this first stage, since I'm doing the demo today, I do not want too much water on here because it's gonna take forever to dry. And that's the thing, when you're doing your own painting, you can get it as wet and juicy as you want, but just realize that if the wet, the more wet and more juicy that it is, the longer it's gonna to take to dry. So I'm just gonna get a little bit of water. I've got water over here on the side of my table and I'm gonna get in there and just get enough so that I can move it around and work with it. Definitely want a lot of this Red Hot Mama. I also wanna see, I forgot now, what this is gonna do. I'm just gonna to try to activate that. And it looks like that's activating just fine. So I've got a lot of Red Hot Mama on there anyway. Oh, I have this taped just barely on the edges on my surface here, my board that's holding that. Is that Red Hot Mama kind of an orangey red? I'm trying, I don't yes. know how true, yeah. Right, it's a real fiery orangey red. Yeah. This is also, I took um, classes with Richard Hawk for years and he's a wonderful painter that lives in Encinitas. And this is one of his favorite colors as well. So I was introduced to that then. So just gonna get some paint all over my paper. It doesn't matter. Normally with abstracts, you have to preserve your wife's whites and you have to, you would guard that white with your life, you know? But you don't have to with this because we're gonna be able to wipe out whites later on. So you really don't have to worry about that. And I'm just smooshing around this paint, not getting a whole lot of variation at this point. And the consistency of that paint is like- It's pretty, it's not creamy. Too, yeah, it's creamy, but I'm just like, this is creamy because I just squeezed it out, but I'm not, it's, see, that's not even running. It's not running. And for my purposes, that's what I want. I don't want it too runny just because we won't be able to get it dry today. Now there's no doubt that's a warm painting. <laughs> you cannot mistake that for anything else. Now I didn't get many fingerprints on here, interestingly enough, but I have one right here and I know I don't want that bright white on the edge of my painting. So I wear gloves because I paint with my fingers and also it's really useful in taking out resist marks that you don't want. So I just rub with my finger like that and that should have taken it right out. Oh, and I got some yellow in there, surprise. Happy accident. I know, and I just love that. I love that, oh my gosh. You know, whatever happens in your painting, pause for just a second and go, do I want that? Because maybe it's really cool. And, and I, I didn't plan that, but maybe that's gonna be the coolest thing in my painting, who knows? I'm gonna rub a little bit of that out. Some of these I'm gonna leave because they might be okay. I can always rub them, rub them out later. And let me get a little bit of that diary light yellow. This I want to have a little bit more liquidy. That's a technical term. Whew, I had it, something brown on my brush. Dang it. Normally I don't care, but if, I, if I'm doing yellow, I really want a pure yellow. So I'm gonna wipe a little bit of whatever that was off of there. And get my brush a little cleaner. Now, just going in there and getting some of that Dari Light Yellow a little bit more juicy than some of the others because I want you to see what it does. See how it's growing? It'll grow and spread. Right now it looks like a nudibranch, those little cool little snail things. I don't know if you guys can see this, but it's almost growing little tentacles. We can see it. Okay, great. I mean, you can't paint that. 
there's no way you're going to paint that. But it's just so cool when that happens. There, now see I had thinner paint here and it's spreading even more. There's a lot of chalk, I think, in Dar Dari Light Yellow. Oh my gosh, and it made a spiral. I put a lot of spirals in my paintings because it's a spiritual symbol for me. And that just made one. So I, I, <laughs> I just love that kind of thing. Okay, no more yellow. I don't think. I don't know. So you can paint in your paper, and I just decided I'm going to do that. And it's, it, this is spreading, this Dari Light Yellow. So that's pretty cool to me. So Wanda, so you've, got, you've got this uh, point that you said it would be your focal point and so forth. Are you thinking right. now about anything to, to do around there? I am, and I'll be talking about that in a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, my, my focal point, I am really thinking about that now, even in the back of my head. I'm thinking that those, those cool things I put in there are probably gonna be wiped away, but that's okay. Because I've learned. I've learned something by putting that paint on the paper and if they don't stay there, who cares? It's, it's learning process. And that's what I'm doing right now. I really encourage you to play during this time. This is a clay marker. I think that's what they are. They're for uh, pottery, for um, ceramics. And it just has all these cool little lines on there. So with, when the, when the uh, Yupo is wet, you can make all kinds of really interesting lines with this thing. You can make thick ones, thin ones. And look what happens when I cross over one set of lines with the other set of lines. All of a sudden you have dimension, which is wonderful. You've got, a, you've got this top line is in the foreground and then the bottom line looks like it's backwards and behind it and further away. So that's pretty neat too. And you can make swerves with it. Anyway, lots of things you can do with this little thing here. And if you don't have one of these things, don't worry. You, you can use practically anything to make marks. Let's see where my, oh, huh, this is a fun thing, a shoe. So <laughs> this is like a little beach shoe and it had a really cool pattern on it. So one day I just thought, well, let's just see what that'll do. And I use it as a stamp. It's got some blue ink on it. So it's making a little pattern in there. And one thing you want to do in a painting is if you put something in one place in the painting, put it in another place in a painting as well for continuity. You want variety, but you also want con um, continuity. So that's made kind of some interesting marks down here. I don't know if I'm going to keep it. Probably I won't keep a lot of this stuff. Oh, here's a little um, bull. <laughs> it's a little bull that my son brought back from Italy. So I thought one day, well, let's just see what that'll do. And that's what I do with you, Pope. Let's just see what that'll do. So it can make some marks and, you know, not all that exciting, honestly. I don't think I've used the bull after I tried it, but I'm just pointing out that it's, it's so wonderful to try things at this point. I can see our time is going by really fast. Okay, another thing is a carrot. I tried a carrot one day. You can, it makes little triangle shapes and marks. So there's the carrot. And, oh, this is a fun one. <laughs> My husband um, handed me something one day. He says, can you put this in the trash for me? Because I was headed that way. And I go, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to throw that away. And what it is is a hearing aid battery uh, package part. It was part of the package for the hearing aid. And it just makes the coolest little stamp. So how cool is that? And, it, it, you know, that was a treasure that could have been thrown in the trash. So <laughs> God forbid. We can try rollers. This is one with a texture. And that does some really cool stuff. That one has a texture, but also this is the roller, kind of roller I will use to tone things down and smooth things out. That's and like roll hard rubber? Pardon me? Hard no, rubber? It's, no, it's foam. Okay. This is just a little kid's foam tool. And I can send you guys a picture of this. I don't think there's a picture in the 
um, supply list. But look how that tones that down. Once you tone that down, that starts popping. Okay. Um, I have a spatula here, but I can't seem to find it. So I guess I just wasn't supposed to show you that. Oh, here's a piece of, um, it's so funny how I have things and then they just walk away. You have that happen in your studio? I don't know how that, oh, I put them over here where I can find them. This is a piece of packing material. So it has these little tiny circles on it. And you can use that just as a stamp as well. And now I'm getting a little bit dry. And at this stage, I would probably wet this down a little bit, a little bit by misting it. But I don't want to do that because then we'll get so dry that I'm going to have to uh, use the hairdryer to show you guys. And this is a cork. So you can make circles in there. And bubble wrap. Just put it down, pull it off, make some really cool texture. If I do it there, I want to do it here as well. Cool. Uh, little commercially made stamp, little round commercially made stamp. I'm trying to find places that are wet enough for me to even see it. I overlap a lot and that's how I get a lot of texture and depth in my paintings. This is just a um, cardboard, corrugated cardboard, and you can use that as well to make lines. And here's my spatula. Oh, yeah, there we go. Just a regular kitchen spatula, that's it. You can draw. Also a credit card, most of us have, have uh, know the credit card trip trick where you can take a credit card and scrape. Or I happen to have this thing that a dentist sent me for a free something or other, which I don't want to go to him. So just, this is maybe how I made those marks on that one at, that's at the Watercolor Society now, because it sure looks a lot like that. Okay. I think that's all I wanted to show you at this point because I really want to move on because the, the next part of the paintings take a lot longer and I want to make sure we have time for that. So questions. Make sure you unmute yourself when you ask your question. No questions. Yes, I have a question. It's Donna. Okay. Um, does that yellow paint that you use, if you did that same thing on regular paper, would it do the same thing or does that just work on you, Po? I don't think it's gonna do the same thing, but I'm not positive. I don't remember, I use that paint a lot and I don't remember it ever doing anything quite like that, no. Okay, just yeah. curious. Yeah, uh, see, that's one of the magic things about you, Po. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. This is Rebecca. It, was that like a blossom? Like kind of what it did? Kind of like a blossom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A Yupo blossom. I guess that's Yupo a good blossom. way. blossom. Yeah. It's very yeah. cool. Yeah. I know. I know. And you know, the other thing I want to say too is that I'm working very dry today because it needs to be dry um, for the demo. But if you want to work juicy, let tip your um, board and your paper. I, don't bend your UPO. That's about the only thing you can do to destroy it. Don't bend it. But tape it onto your surface and then tip it and then you get some nice juicy things and then put it down and go away and leave it alone for a while to dry because it will continue to do stuff. So that's a really um, wonderful thing about UPO as well. Anybody else? Guess not. Okay. Moving on. Still see it, Ralph? Still there. Okay. All four sides. Okay. Now at this point I have a couple of ways I could proceed. If I wanted just to do an intuitive painting, what I would do is just decide that's gonna be my focal point there. And then I would take some of my tools and stencils and things like that 
and just develop one of those compositions like a cruciform or something like that. But I've decided today that I am going to go from one of my asphalt crack drawings. This is probably as planned as I ever get, more so than usual. But sometimes things turn out better if you have a little bit of plan. So this is my drawing. And I'm just going to loosely put this drawing right on here. But I'm looking to see if I have, if it's dry enough. Oh. You know, we're just, this is about experimentation, right? So I've got some wet areas here. I'm just going to see what this is going to do, this um, Stabilo pencil. And it's, Kathleen Scoggin told you about this. It's so funny because Kathleen Scoggin took my workshop earlier in the summer and then I took, a, a, well, actually, I did a little mentoring with her. And she'll do, she's going to start doing that now. She's setting up mentoring, one-on-one um, -on -one mentoring. So you can check that out if that's something you're interested in. Okay, I'm just holding this to the side, and I'm just making a kind of loose drawing. And I just changed my mind about what I'm going to do. And that happens all the time. So the Stabilo pencil will will interact with the water and, and make loose kind of lines? And... No, well, yeah, if it's juicy, but if it's dry, it's just gonna be like a dark pencil. And I'll show, I'm not gonna forgo doing that, I'm still gonna do that, but I'm gonna wanna start with this stencil. Oh, crikey, I didn't tell you how to make a stencil. It's so easy. Did you say crikey? Yeah, crikey. <laughs> <laughs> Fiddlesticks, huh? No, yeah, uh, like Steve yeah, Irwin like here. Steve Irwin is probably channeling you right now. <laughs> so I'm going to put this right down on my paper. And, and who knows, maybe it'll do something neat and maybe it'll, it won't. But, you know, my this board on top of that wet-ish Yupo might do something cool. All you do to make your own stencil is simply take a blade and cut into a glossy, water, I'm um, not water, um, photo paper. And that's it. It's the simplest thing in the world. So that was my $50,000 demo on how to make a stencil with photo paper. Luckily, we're Don't. not paying you quite that much. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad I remembered to do that. So I have my little dot on here. And I'm not even going to take that off right now. I'm just curious to see what that'll, that'll do for me. This is going to be my focal point. I've decided, I decided this ahead of time. And sometimes I get ideas because uh, my family meditates together. And sometimes I get visual things come into uh, my brain when we meditate. And other times I'll just wake up in the morning with a painting in my head, or I'll just get quiet sometimes and just start thinking about it. And I just start thinking about how a painting will be. So those are all ways that paintings can come to me. And I know some of you that are even here today have said, what goes on in your brain? And that's kind of some of it. To take off this paint, that's what I'm gonna be doing now is wiping paint off. These are Trader Joe's sponges. They're only about three bucks and you get a bunch of them. And then I cut them into little pieces like this. And they're all compressed to begin with like that. And I cut them with just that same blade that I was showing you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I'm gonna dip it in water, but not, this is really important. This is the, you wanna get as much of that water out of there as possible. You want this barely damp. And I'm even going to use a paper towel as well to get some more of that water out of there. This is something really to pay attention to and remember. I'm going to tell you some of the stuff that's really important because some of my students um, somehow or another didn't hear that part. And they'll go, well, this, you know, nothing worked for me. And that's because it was too wet. And then when you push down, and you can do a paper towel as well, but again, it has to be just damp. So barely push down on this. If I push down too hard, I'm gonna to get too much water 
and it's going to seep right underneath the edges of this, especially since this is not a commercial stencil. It's a stencil that I made. So this is also an experiment because I've never made this particular kind of stencil. It's a brand new stencil. So we'll see. We'll see how that works. And just little by little, not pressing down hard, and I'm holding one, one part of it with my finger because it was just lifting up. If you use a commercially made stencil, you, it's a lot easier because they're stiffer. Is that right? <laughs> Is that correct English? I don't know. You're the teacher. We believe it. <laughs> no, no, I mean the English part. <laughs> More stiff or stiffer, I don't know. Oh, good. I'm not going to use too many stencils because it's watching me wipe this out is about as interesting as watching paint dry. I realize that. Okay, so I got a lot of that out, but we still need to get more out because I want to go down to as, as much white as possible. So I'm going to take a barely damp paper towel and we'll see how that goes. I think I just realized I have a hole in my glove. Hang on a minute, I'm going to glove up again. Getting a glove on with a wet hand is always fun, right? <laughs> so barely damp paper towel. I'm even going to squeeze that with a little piece of tissue here. And I'm going to keep wiping. Now, if I didn't want this to move around, I would tape it. If I had more time, I'd probably tape it on the edges. Just take some... Uh, painter's tape, that blue painter's tape. And now I'm just gently taking out more of that paint. And I also could use a Mr. Clean Magic Eraser to get some more of the paint out of there too. I'm going to try a tissue here and see if I can get even more out. I think I'm going to put yellow in this area. I'm, it's going to be a warm part of the painting. So I'm not too concerned with getting all of that out. And I don't want to take up too much of your time because we have so much that I want to show you. But I, really, if I want to get, if I really want to get a pure color, I would work on getting a lot of that out of there, even more so. Okay, then I just pull that off and voila, I have, oh, I really, you know what I really love? And I didn't plan this, those lines that I put in there before are intersecting here and that's kind of going underneath it. So it's giving me a lot of cool stuff that's happening with texture and with depth. So I'm just thrilled actually with how that looks. And my little piece of tape is no longer necessary. So let's get in there and take that out. And you don't have to put that piece of tape in there. That's just me because I'm just, I know, brain damaged when it comes to where my focal point's supposed to be. <laughs> it's not that, it's just, I get so involved with my paintings that I just forget about it and I go on. So now, Stabilo pencil and drawing. And there again, best laid plans. I may uh, keep, keep this drawing and I may, may do something different. This is just uh, kind of getting some of that in there. It doesn't matter that it's exactly the same as what I decided I was gonna do. As a matter of fact, it's already not. Okay. You know, one thing that struck me from the patterns you've already got down there, Wanda, is that circular thing makes me think of a treble clef and the white lines and so forth make me think of a musical staff. And cool. Then, then there's these little sea organisms or whatever that'll, that are bopping around in there. <laughs> very, uh, very creative. Well, you know, I just did that by playing, right? 
Yeah. And so now you're seeing now you're seeing things and and that's what'll happen. You'll start doing these paintings and you'll go, oh, look at that. Look at that, that I have in my painting. And uh, yeah. You've drawn us into your head. I know. That's <laughs> so I'm many. So, <laughs> as you should be. <laughs> yeah. So many people, I can't tell you how many people have said that to me. Because I do some paintings that are just downright bizarre. But I, I mean, that makes me happy when somebody goes, that is just weird. I go, thanks. <laughs> That's the nicest thing anybody ever said to me. I know, I know, I just love it. Roberta Dyer introduced me to her friend that way. This is Wanda Honeycutt, she does really weird stuff. <laughs> I go, thank you so much. I, I said, you know I love that, right? She says, and she says, yeah, that's why I said it. Oh boy, I wish I could stand back like Annette. We were talking about Annette Paquette. And uh, get some energy going here with this drawing. But I've got close quarters. You can't tell that, but I've really got some close quarters here. Okay, that's about it for my drawing. And, and I mentioned Richard Hawk. He also does shape-based paintings. He does them with figures, but in a way, my training with him has helped me with this because really I've made just a bunch of shapes on this painting, big shapes. So how many do we have? One, two, three, I'm gonna count that as one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight shapes. He recommends seven. And <clears throat> oh, then maybe that's one other one. But at any rate, I don't have too many big shapes in this painting. I'm so excited because this is turning out really different than what I thought, but I, but I like it. So I'm going to do one more stencil, and this is a commercial one. Wanda? Uh, yes. So on your shapes, you mentioned seven shapes. Is, is odd a number good, like maybe five or nine, but not four? Uh, no. No, uh, you know, I know what you're talking about, because in art, we really, you know, if we're putting something in a painting, we want to do odd, sh odd, odd number of shapes. And um, for the shape-based painting, not really. We never considered that. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, no. <laughs> the answer is just no. <laughs> we didn't consider it. Now, I knew in advance, because I did my, tr my th this popped into my head, I was taking a nap or trying to take a nap and I wasn't sleeping because I was thinking about a painting, the painting, and this popped into my head. Oh, I really want to use this stencil. I love this stencil. I've used it in quite a few paintings. And one thing about stencils too is you want to alter them as much as you can because you don't want somebody to come up to your painting and goes, oh, I use that stencil. It, it tends to be more like an arts and crafts project at that point. So we want to alter them at least a little bit. I'm not going to take a whole lot out of this because I don't want this to be my focal point. So I'm going to use the same sponge that I was using. I'm not, I didn't even put it into water and I'm getting some of this out of here. I don't know what these colors are going to be, but not too bright. It would be probably different if this looks like sun rays to me and maybe it would be different to make the sun rays some other color besides a warm color. That would be kind of fun. Now I'm channeling Roberta Dyer. She, as she watch her demo, she'll go, well, that would be kind of fun. Of course, I have to have a Southern accent to do that. Well, that would be kind of fun. <laughs> I didn't do it. Oh. She's so good too. If you get a chance to take classes with Roberta Dyer, she's fabulous. If you like abstract. She does abstracted people mostly, and she's just the queen of it, in my opinion. I love her, and she, she's, uh, many of you know this, she lost her husband recently, but she's right back at art, bless her heart. Okay, now I can come back and wipe more of that out at another time, but we'll just see if that's gonna be enough to do what I wanted to do. I uh, actually now I like that I'm that looking. It's not contrasty with as contrasty as the the spiral you did. Yeah, it has some variation. So yes, 
and I really want that to connect and I have some options of how to do that. I could take my brush and do it, but with UPO that tends to get uh, problematic. So I'm not, I'm gonna leave that. Somehow or another, I wanna connect those with this, but I may do it with line. I may do it with a Stabilo pencil a little bit later on, we'll see. I'm gonna go right in, oh, this is hard to know what to do. Um, with this with this shape. My intention was to put that Dari Lied Yellow in there. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put part of that Dari Lied Yellow in there. And then we'll see. I may even end up taking that out because I kind of like the white at this point. Um, now you can see me thinking out loud and making decisions. It's decision, decision, decision. What I have decided to do, since it's a cruciform, is I want these two bands of the arm. And when you're doing a cruciform, unless you're doing a religious painting, don't make it just a straight cross shape. Try to vary it a little bit. And this arm may be skinnier, this arm may be fatter. Having a diagonal works really well. Diagonals increase, create interest and excitement in a painting. Horizontals create more of a peaceful, and verticals are somewhat more exciting, but not as, as exciting as an oblique or a diagonal line. So it's nice to have all of those in the painting. And I already do. We've got horizontals, we've got um, verticals, and we've got diagonals. So that's kind of cool. All right, what am I gonna do with this now? They're gonna be, we have plenty of time to play, yay. Okay. I'm gonna go in and start on my blues. So I'm gonna take this paint in this area and I'm going to take some of that out of there. I'm not so sure I want to get rid of these lines because I'm kind of liking them but they may stay, they may go. But for right now we're getting rid of this so I can have a clean place to work. Yupo's tough in terms of blending it together but remind me if I forget that I want to show you how to blend and most likely I will show you because it usually happens where I need to. And uh, you can just blot that out of there. Or you can take a roll of toilet paper and roll it over there. That works. Now I've got a little area there where I can start to paint my blues. And if I didn't mention it before, I can't live without turquoise. So we're gonna get some turquoise going in here. And you know, I really think with this painting, if I would have done a value study, it would have helped me. I would know where my darks, darkest darks and my lightest lights, well, your darkest darks and your lightest lights should be around your focal point, because that's one of the things that make a focal point. But I would know more about where my darks, middle values, and lights would be. So it would have behooved me to do that, but I didn't. So we'll, we'll see how it goes here. But how would you do a value study for this where it all just kind of evolved as you went around the painting? Well, because I could have done it with this. I could have done this, and I could have done this dark, and I could have done that light. And I could have made each, each section with some uh, charcoal or something. I could have done a value study with this drawing on the drawing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're going in with turquoise now. Ah, here's the intuitive part coming in. I put that in there, I'm going, yes. Oh, like, thank you. I love that color. And I don't want just turquoise in there though. Let's get some variety in here. That was uh, Ultramarine Turquoise by Daniel Smith, by the way. And now I'm going into Quinn Purple, I think, is what I'm going to put in here. But I don't want just Quinn Purple because I don't like that pinky purple. I can tell, too, I have too much water. Too much. So I'm going to dry that off a little bit, and I'm going into my Ultramarine Blue, and it's right next to the purple for a reason, because I, I hardly ever put that much of a pinky purple on any painting. It's just doesn't, it's not pleasant for me. So I'm gonna go right in here with that purple. 
and just drop that in. This is pretty juicy, so I'm gonna be able to blend that. And I just put some various, various marks in there. I'm also thinking that it may just be a little bit too, um, I needed some muted, muted color in there. So I'm going into my sepia. Sepia will mute down any color. Look at how that is so rich. Once I started putting that sepia in there, getting some darks in there and some neutrals. And this purple is starting to go up. And that's, here is the joy of Yupo. I can't paint that. You can't paint that with anything else. But you can with Yupo. So I'm just getting a little bit of variation in that shape. And I'm loving that. Not to mean that I would keep it forever and ever, but I love it now. Wanda, is, I, your, is your painting flat right now or is it slightly flat? Yes. No, it's flat. So that's just running, being flat. Yeah. And I don't want it to run too much, so I'm just going to leave it there. And I really want a, a neutral in here. I might just leave that red there and just go over it with a sepia and see how that is. Because, you know, vibrant colors are wonderful, but if you put too many vibrant colors in a painting, you don't know where to look. Your eye just gets lost and it gets really busy. So I'm going to just neutralize that. Neutralize it. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. I'm going to get a neutral going on in there, but I might put a little bit of the turquoise in there too, and maybe a little bit of the purple. And we'll see how that goes. Now, I, I, I just have a feeling that because this is at the edge of the painting, that's going to be too busy. So I'm going to go in with my either dabber or roller or a makeup sponge. This is a makeup sponge, and I think I'm going to just kind of tone that down just a little bit and uh, smooth that out a little bit so it's not quite so interesting. Some of us don't have makeup sponges. <laughs> just tell well, you can... Okay, here you go, Ralph. How about packing foam? Okay. Okay. Packing foam. All right, that'll work too. And a foam brush and a roller. Now I'm going to show you a couple of things. So rollers can go over, this is wet paint, and look at how that's smoothing things out and blending things in. So you can use it to blend and to smooth. And I might want to take that down somewhere else in the painting as well. I, don't, I guess I don't have enough on there. But once you're working in one area, you can take it down and work it into another area too if you have enough paint on your brush. But speaking of working things into the painting, I think I'm going to go down and work on a different part of the painting right now. I'm going to get some of that sepia down in here. Remember how Kathleen Scoggin told you to um, kind of hide the edges or blend the edges into your paintings when you're using a stencil so it doesn't just look like a stencil. And you, it's hard to do that with Yupo unless you have like a little foam dabber or something. And that's what these are. It's a foam dabber. These are just kids tools you can get on Amazon. They're very cheap. Oh, I just looked at something that I was going to try. Was it pecan? <laughs> well, not very exciting, but you know, I thought I'd try it. Pecan. All right. Now to blend, I'm going to use this little dabber right in here to blend this area. This is one of the really helpful things I have found. And this is, I think, unique to me. Maybe it's not. But I haven't seen anybody else that's doing this. So this is just stuff I found from playing around. So now those lines are kind of blending down into this shape here. And I don't want that shape down there to be that busy either. So I'm gonna take my roller and go over it. This textured roller is, I could get it on Amazon. I know they're currently out of it, but they, I think they have a little one inch one. And that is, oh my gosh, that does such cool stuff. 
Look at that texture that's in there now. We've got texture, but it's more consistent than, than that. That's just got all these different shapes. It's really interesting, but if you had that all over your painting, I think it'd just be uncomfortable to even look at. So now I've got this talking to this. This is a Richard Hawk term. This is talking to that. I don't have anything talking to that yet, so I wanna put a little bit of something in there. But before I go away from this, I wanna show you stamping, because I have a favorite stamp for rock kind of shapes. And I, my idea was this was gonna be a kind of a rock shape. Who knows, it may decide to be something else. This is a stamp that I, it's a commercial stamp. It's got all these textures on it. So it shows there the, one of the textures and that's this one. It looks like cracks in a sidewalk. So I just, I don't know if you guys can see that very well, yeah. but it's adding, can you? Yes. Good, it's just adding this really interesting texture to that. People will go up to your painting and say, how did you do that? You know, this just like amazement that that can happen. And you can use this stamp on watercolor paper, but it's not gonna look like that. Now I wanna really get some more of that turquoise in here cause it's kind of driving me crazy that, not driving me crazy, but it's uncomfortable that that's the only place that that color is. And I wanna deal a little bit with the focal point cause I see our time is going. I wanna make sure that I address everything that I want to. I wanna get a real dark around some of these lights in here because remember one of the things that makes a focal point a focal point is the lightest lights and the darkest darks. So I'm actually gonna use a brush right now, one of the few times I'll even use a brush. And let's see, I actually I put some colors on my um, drawing, because this was gonna be yellow and this was gonna be a dark purple. Well, surprise, I don't think it is. We'll see. So I'm going into my um, ultramarine, I think it's ultramarine turquoise. No. Uh, what did I say before? It's, um, oh yeah, ultramarine turquoise by Daniel Smith. Yummy color. Okay, so I'm gonna mix it with this red and that's gonna give us more of a neutral, but I'm thinking that might be okay. If it's not, I can always take it out. I've created a little circular shape here. I'm gonna go around because I kind of like that. And now I'm going up into that white area, which wasn't my intention, but I'm gonna leave it because, crikey, if it happened, it might be you know, just the coolest thing ever. Mm, I'm liking this. And let's get, I put a lot of dark in here because I may be lifting areas where you know you want some lights. You, you need to go over with dark first if you really want a lot of contrast. Uh, put a dark in first and then you can go to the lights. I don't know if I want to get what I want to get rid of here in terms of these cool cross shapes, but I'm going to go right next to that white. Try that and try this down here. I wanna bring that color down into here. And since it's there, let's go ahead and bring it down into here for continuity's sake. That's gotten a little dark, so you can't even tell that it's turquoise. So I'm gonna lift some of that off. Got a little too much water for lifting, but I can take a tissue. I'm hoping I make lots of mistakes because then you can see how to correct them. So I'm taking a tissue and just blotting that. And really there, what, there are no mistakes, right? So I have that cool turquoisey brown color. So let's try to see if I can get some of that down here. Yeah. Okay. Because I want my cross to be, this is gonna be the top part of my cross. And then the arm goes out here. You might even get a little bit of a shape going out there. Look what just happened there. Now I've added dimension to this because since I put this shape underneath it, it looks like that's a shadow on the side of this shape. So it's kind of making it look three dimensional. And I do that a lot 
with certain shapes. I will make them look kind of three-dimensional by putting a shadow underneath them. Here I'm continuing down with this turquoise and maybe even a little purple. This is part of my cross, so I want it different than everything else. This is going to be my cool color. Okay, so you can see I'm starting to develop areas that are calm here and here is calmer than the rest of it. An area that's dialed up, I'm probably going to be going over that when it dries with a roller to add some texture. And I'm starting to get my focal point in here, but it's not quite dark enough for my taste. So I'm thinking I'm going to put even a little bit more something. I just went into ultramarine blue and my ultramarine uh, turquoise, getting really dark turquoise in there. Ugh. See, this is hard because I really love what's happening here, but I want that to be a little darker, I think. I don't know. Now even I can't take that out right now. I may take it out later if it's just not working, but I want to get some darks in here. Never mind. Off with its head. I just realized how yummy that is when you get that dark in there. Ultramarine blue and burnt sienna will make a neutral. You guys probably all know that, but just in case. And I've got my ultramarine turquoise in there as well. So we've got a combination of stuff in here. That was, I don't like that, but it's a nice neutral. So I don't want to waste that paint and I don't want to um, do anything else different with it. So I think I'm going to put some of that right in here. It's a nice neutral. You know, if it's already on your brush, you know, you can put it somewhere. I'm going to put some little dark shapes in here. And I'm going to put this line as a dark. There. That's really popping that white out now. So there again, I think I'm on the right track of getting some darks in there. And maybe just having a little light colored center in there might, might do the trick. Some more darks in here. Now I didn't exactly get any turquoise in there anywhere else, did I? I can tell this painting is not going to be done with this, but I'm going to stop here in about five minutes and before I go any farther for questions. Um, but I want to get in just a little bit more turquoise over here. It'll just make me feel better. Let me get rid of those lines. In my workshops, what I do is I, you know, I teach a little bit, I do a demo and then I let people go paint and then I do a demo and let people go paint. But I just, since we only have the two hours, I just thought we would, you would get a lot more out of this. And then you have the video, so you can do that when you get the video if you want to work at home. Ralph, is there anything on my agenda for stage, whatever stage this is? Um, that I haven't covered yet. Hmm. I don't think so. Okay. I would, I would think we might want to open it up for questions. There might be some, yeah. some thoughts from the students. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think this is a good time to open up for questions. One thing I am going to do is connect that dark shape that I just made in there right to the edge. And 
let me just fix this before I can't. I'm going to use a roller right here on the edge just to kind of tone that down a little bit and blend it in a little bit. It was a little bit too busy over there. This is again, just want to double check that I'm viewing it the same way you are. What is the top of your picture? This. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. That's the top. Yeah. yeah. We see it the other way. Sideways. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Are you able to follow along well enough with that though? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, you know, this is still, this reminds me of water and I'm not so sure I want that, but I'm gonna leave it for now. But if I wanted to tone that down, I would just get some paint on my roller and just like that. See how that added, there's a little bit of texture coming in there. I kind of just like that. It's not so happy. <laughs> that's Chuck McPherson's term. It's like, Oh, well, that's too happy of a painting. Okay. So, anybody have any questions? Um, could you repeat what you mentioned about lines? Um, diagonal lines are exciting. Circle, I think you said was peaceful. I can't remember. Sure. Horizontal lines are more peaceful. And vertical lines pick up the excitement a little bit. And then vertical lines are the most exciting. So you can set your mood by what kind of lines you use. And in an abstract like this, I find it nice to use all of those elements. So, but you don't have to, but anyway, that's, that's what it is. Could you put your picture up so we see it the way it's supposed to be oriented? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You had also mentioned circles. Can you see this? Yeah. Is that looking right now? Pull it back a little bit. Uh, Towards me? Farther away, oh. down. This way? No, no, other way. Opposite way. There? There you go. OK. Yeah, so this top, bottom. So this is where my So we can't form. see the whole thing. You can't? No. That's better. Now, yeah. Scroll up a little it? bit. This way? The opposite way. Down, yeah. down. Keep going, keep going. You have to say towards me or towards my right or left, because up and towards down. Towards you, pull towards you, star towards you. OK. Oh, no, that's not where I'm at. <laughs> 90 degrees to that. OK, so I hear smiley face, star, rectangle. And star to your left. Pull the left side further left. Yes, correct. There? Better. Yeah. Okay. But we still can't see the whole thing because your uh, camera is slightly too close. Yeah. Okay. It's nice to see it oriented this way. Thank you. Wanda, this is Jamie. Uh, Ralph's letting me crash so I can see how you set up for next month <laughs> when I do the demo. But I wanted to ask, how oh, do you hi, finish? Jamie. How do you seal these off? Oh, that's such a good question. I'm so glad you asked because I was hoping somebody would so I would remember. First of all, if you don't have, you don't want to spray them, then what you do is get them behind uh, Plexi as fast as you can. You can mat them and put them behind Plexi. But however, if you want to seal them so you can mail them or you're not going to put them behind Plexi right away, I would recommend, can you see these? Yes. Let me hold them down where I was before. Then I can, I can tell, I can see what I'm doing better. I think. Okay. How's that? Oh, no. uh, yeah. This way? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we've got um, gloss and satin archival varnish. And if you're going to spray this on UPO, my recommendation is what I have done anyway, and it's worked two coats of gloss, you put it on with your painting oriented one way, and then you turn your painting so it's oriented the other way. And you follow the directions on the can really carefully about how to shake it, how far away to paint, uh, spray it, and that kind of thing. And then I use a final coat of satin, just one. If you do too many coats of satin, you're gonna mute down your painting. So you don't wanna do that. And that's why if you're going to put multiple coats on, you want to start with the gloss first. 
But I know I have somebody else that's used uh, Krylon Clear Finish, and that's worked really well for her, and she just did one coat. And so, uh, you know, okay. that worked for her, and I haven't tried it. And I saw online on Amazon where people had tried it, and it had, it, they said it put globs of goo on their paper. But I'm thinking that's because they didn't shake it enough. Some of these things, you just have to shake the heck out of them. They say two minutes, and you may have to do more than that. Turn it upside down and really shake it, because I've had things like that happen too, where I have droplets all over my painting, okay. and then you want to ah! So you, so you don't spray them all the time? I have not, I've only sprayed my last set of paintings. I, okay. For years, I never sprayed them at all. I just put them behind a huh. uh, plexi. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and that's where they stayed. Hang on a minute. Thank I got, you. Sure, I've got allergies, so my nose is, needs a little attention here. <laughs> I can hear you, so if anybody has a question. Okay, we good to go? I think so. All righty. Yeah, um, I wish there was a way. Okay, what's that? I had a question about your Stabila pencil. Sure. Is it... Um, yeah, grease oriented that it resists or watercolor or what is its characteristic? These are, these are watercolors, so they will um, activate with water. Okay. And if you want to use a pencil, this is a good question too. I just love questions because then it reminds me of what I wanted to say too. So if you don't want a water-based pencil, you want that mark to stay on there, even if you paint over it with water, China markers are the way to go. These are more permanent. I don't say they're 100% permanent, but a china marker is a, a pencil that you can put on that will really stay through a lot of painting. So there you go. I'm afraid to ask questions. Yeah, what about those micron um, pens? Are they, do they get wet with your... Um... Do you use those, the Micron pens? I know what they, yeah, I know what they are, but I haven't used them on UPO, so I don't know. Okay. But I do know you can also use the uh, ink tints. They just don't make as nice of a mark, in my opinion, as the Stabilos. But the ink tints, you can use those, and those are another way to get lines on. And I'm going to show a final way to get lines on as well. And that's with a, a little bottle that you can paint on. So this painting is far from done. And how I would, I would just keep proceeding in the same way. I just wanna make sure that I have enough time to show you the line work. So I'm gonna work 10 more minutes on this. And then I'm gonna show you some finishing touches that are pretty cool. I really wanna get some more uh, little shapes in this focal point area. Oh, look at this, is, looks like a person. Now that's cool. I often end up with people looking shape, some kind of a person looking shape in my paintings and I will enhance those if I like it. And I see one right there. It looks like he's going off into this void, which is just awesome to me. I I Wanda, how do you know when you're finished? What's that? How do you know when you're finished? You know, people ask me that all the time and it's a really good question. I think it's different for every artist. And for me, it's a feeling. I get almost obsessed about a painting. I get all of this energy that comes in me about a painting. And when that energy goes away and I feel like I can put my hawk and my heart in my painting, and I'll tell you about that in a second, then I know I'm done. And my hawk and my heart is I put in a tiny little hawk, it's like a pencil, little tiny a stick figure hawk, tiny, like that big. And then I put a little heart somewhere and they're hidden and they're tiny. And it's just, it's just a feeling for me. It feels done. It feels like the painting is done with me. <laughs> so that may sound a little strange, but that's how it is for me. And I know it's gonna be different for everybody. And, and you typically don't go back to a painting after, after that feeling? Oh that yes, it, I could feel done with it. And then later on, um, yeah. And then later on go back because I have new skills. And that's what's happened with this. I don't know if you can see it, but that painting on the wall. Can you see that painting? The Kuan Yin? No? Yes, part of it. The, the, part of it. The one of the of figure? The figure? Yeah. 
that started as a, <laughs> believe it or not, that was done in plein air of a statue. And then I never liked the painting, so I brought it out recently and I, um, I finished it, so, yeah. Okay. This um, is far I have from a question bad. about composition. Do you sure. have a sense of how much of the painting you want in, to have the contrast? How much of the painting? Yeah, no, there's dark, not a percent. No, it, there's not a percentage that I, I, I go by. I'm, I'm thinking maybe about um, 25 to 30 percent contrast, and the rest, um, like your warm, would be, you know, like 80 or so percent or a little bit more, maybe. And then um, the contrast would be the rest. So that's about, but I've never really thought of it in those terms, but you just want to have the majority of it warm or the majority of it cool. And I need a lot more darks in here. And see right now I've got some, some darks, there's a dark and I've got lights and I've got midtones, but I would just dial it up. And some of these little areas where I have these little shapes, I'm going to go, go, go in with my Stabilo pencil and just kind of, add a little bit more in there. But I wouldn't do this honestly until about the end because I'm gonna lose a lot of this, but I just wanted to show you. Oh look, there's another little heart. That's sweet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and if Karen Knudsen uh, talked about uh, lines a lot and she will go in and do the same sort of thing. She'll make lines more interesting. You don't want a line just to be the same all the way through. Look at how much more interesting that is than the way it was before. Even if you add a little bit of something in here to make that line a little bit more interesting, that's a lot more interesting in my opinion than just having a straight line. And, and again, I would want to connect these, these shapes up here to this and I'm going to do that, but I just want to um, do something with this. I'm going to go ahead and put my Dari Light Yellow in there. I'm thinking that might make me feel better. Wanda, how long does it usually take you to do a painting? Oh, it's so variable. I just, did a, I just did a three foot by five foot painting. Wow. And that took me, you know, um, <laughs> days, months. Because months. <laughs> <laughs> it was really complicated. And, uh, and then I can get a painting. I, I'm not a fast painter. You know, like Louis Juarez, he says if, he takes, if a painting takes him longer than an hour to do, he doesn't want to do it. You know, <laughs> it's just like, that's way too long. And uh, I'm not like that. I spend some time with my paintings. Now see, already getting that Dari Light Yellow, it just makes me happier. And I go a lot by that. What is making me happy? What in this painting makes me happy? And that is making me happy. I like it. So... I like that a whole lot better. I also still need a lot of shapes. I know what I want to show you. I've got to show you this. And that is how to add shapes to an area by dabbing. Oh, this is something that uh, Kathleen Scoggin told me about. It's uh, the, um, it's concentrated watercolor uh, with Dr. Martins. You might've heard of that, but this is a color called antelope. I never had tried antelope, so I, I will probably try that later. Let me get a stencil. How do I choose a stencil? Oh, what's going to make me happy? What's going to add some interest to my painting? I, is, and I hold this up here. Do I want these little squares? Do I want something that I made myself? Maybe. Do I want these little circles? Um, don't know. But this, this, is, this is really important though that I show you this and this is um, not dry here. So let me just, I can't do it. I can't do it here. I want to put some little shapes up in here, but it's too wet and we don't have time for it to dry. So I'm going to go down here and show you. Here, I, I hold my stencil up in, in different areas to see kind of where I might want some of those shapes. And then I'm going to tape it off where I don't want it to go. I don't want any of those shapes to be. And I have my lines drawn here. It's not exact, but close enough. Close enough. And 
this is, I use all different kinds of stencils and you don't, like I said, you don't want your painting to look like, oh my God, that's a, I, I use that stencil too. Although this stencil is so common, there's a lot of people that use it. Okay. Now, I'm not gonna take time to tape it all off, but you get the idea. Wherever you don't want to have that design on your painting, you're gonna tape it off. And there's a couple of things to do here. You can take it off with a take painting paint off with one of the sponges. So we can do that, which is fun. You can also put paint on with a dabber or a roller. So I've got a little bit of this sepia here. I don't want to get this too wet because if you get it too wet, remember, it's going to go right underneath your stencil. So not too wet, but I have to get it wet enough to work. So let's try a little bit of stevia, still too wet. I'm going to dab it on a paper towel or a tissue. Make sure it's not gooey wet. And then I can dab into this area. Look at that beautiful texture. Oh, it's just, I mean, I just love that. And you don't want it all the same, and you don't even want the same color, probably. You can do different colors. You get different shapes. You can, depending on whether, this is a question you asked, Ralph, are you gonna put color on or take it off? It just depends on your paper, and you will do this, find this out by experimenting, that sometimes when you put do the one technique, the same technique, it'll take the paint off. And you do the same exact technique, and it'll put the paint on. So that's UPO for you. You just have to experiment and go with the flow. And where's my little roller? Here we go. I'm gonna see if I can get some of that paint off. Okay. So I'm taking it off with the roller too. Rolling it in there, dabbing it. There we go. And once again, I would do probably more, but I want you to see what's happening in here. I had some that I took off and some that I put on. And this, these textures, once again, you can use to blend areas. You can use to add depth and dimension and character to your painting. I Just dabbing that little bit of paint right up in there makes me, I just love it because you're, it's just not so, I don't know. It's just giving it character. Yeah. You laid that stencil over your painting. Weren't you worried about it lifting something off in an area you didn't want to mess with? Excellent question. That would actually happen, but it has happened to me so many times that it has done that. I didn't intend for it. And I pull it off and I go, oh, that's so cool. So that's, you just never know. If you forget, this, just loosen up let go, have fun, you don't like it, you know, it might do something really cool. Cause I just wet that. So let's just say that was wet. And then I might get something really cool. That didn't make anything really cool, but you know, sometimes it does. So you just never know. Oh, and there, I can just make a mark with my finger too. Anyway, you can keep playing and playing and playing and playing forever. Now we only have 15 minutes. So I wanna show you line work because and also, I don't have time, but just put a mat around your painting. Have a working mat like Kathleen Scoggin taught you to. And that will help this painting not look so messy. And you can tell really what you've got. Because you have all this extra paint out here, making the whole thing just look just too messy. So, line work. Normally I make my line work with acrylic paint. And I put some acrylic paint in these little bottles. There's different kinds. There's this kind. There's this one that's called fine line applicator, fine tip. And various ones and they have various amounts of success and problems. All of them have problems with getting clogged up with some acrylic. But this is, gold is one of my favorite. And so I put a little bit of uh, golden, 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 gold acrylic and a little bit of water and just mix that up. And these, you have to put a little straight pin in like a sewing pin. 
and I try it on a little scrap piece of paper first. I usually have a little piece of Yupo handy where I try things. And this is my thing that I try things. This has already been sprayed, uh, Jamie. So the only thing you can do with this is put acrylic on top of it. And, and Golden Acrylic told me actually not to do that, but I did it anyway. They said they didn't have anything that would work. So I'm trying my little gold line on there to see how that's going to work. And in these areas, I might do this for my shapes now. I might make some little shapes in here. And what I can do with these is fill them in with watercolor after it dries. So remember when you have your focal point is where you want some of these small shapes. And, and you can, I do calligraphy. It's kind of my signature thing. And I could go throughout the entire painting with some um, line work. I also like to connect to the edges a lot of times with the gold paint. So there's that. Hey, Wanda, when you fill in some of your shapes uh, that you drew with your pencil, does the watercolor stay in the in that inside the lines of those pencil marks um in the oh in the pencil marks yeah i don't know that i yeah um it's gonna be, because it? it's aquarelle it's gonna um uh you know blend somewhat now okay. this is acrylic right so once that dries it's not going to but yes the pencil marks are going to blend a little bit okay so yeah, maybe it may be something you like and maybe something you don't like so that's just something that you can decide but these are little jewel like things they look like little jewels once you fill that in with some watercolor. They're really pretty and I love to do that. Mm, this is, okay, this I did uh, is watercolor, white watercolor mixed with water. And I was in the middle of a workshop and I said, you know, and I was loving my painting so much. I said, you know, I was gonna try this, but I just, I'm chickening out because I love my painting so much and I've never tried it before. I don't know what it's gonna do. And then I said, oh man, you know, here I am telling you guys to be bold and try different stuff. And then I say, I'm not going to, forget that. So I went ahead and tried it and it turned out great. But it could, it could have turned out bad too, but I don't know if I want white in this particular painting. So uh, same thing here. You can just make all kinds of cool lines with these things. And it really helps to especially make a messy painting look uh, more tied together. It's, a, it's, it's an integration tool for one thing. You can tie the bottom of your painting with the top. And oh, that's what I would have done with these things. That's what I was thinking I might do is to use some line work and tie these together. I, Wanda, you said, I have a question about that last yeah. item there. Did you say you used white watercolor and? Yes, mm -hmm. right, titanium white. Okay, have you ever yeah. used like gesso or something like that to put in there? I think that you probably could. I haven't, I've just used golden acrylic, liquid acrylic. acrylic. Okay. I think that you could use gesso, but yeah. So, so right now I'm trying to tie these shapes into this. I want the viewer's eye to go right in here. I don't want to just make straight lines, but I'm making some various lines from these kind of sun, sun ray types of things and going right into there, which doesn't show up that much. So I probably might have to dial that in a little bit more, but just look at the interest that these shapes have uh, done. And also, oh, let's see, where are we at? Oh, 10 minutes, yay. I, I want to show you just a little bit more about the shadows under shapes. There's so much to explore with this. It's so oh, fun. Kathy Coney's daughter. She's down at the house. Oh. Hi, so I'm getting a little bit of sepia on here because I want to make a shadow type shape underneath this shape. So I'm just going to go right along the bottom of it. And that brings that out into more of a three dimension, like this one did, that can do that too. So adding shadows underneath different shapes can really make uh, some interesting pop out sort of things like you've got these little shapes that are floating off your paper. Okay, we've got time for questions. So I think that's where we're at. Go for it folks, yeah. questions. 
Whoever that is, I can barely hear. I think that's something off. Oh, somebody else talking in another room? Yeah. Uh, Ralph, I think it's Margaret Stephen. Oh, okay. Uh, so, yeah, put everybody on mute. There you go. Yeah, I just muted her. Okay. Wow. Are you overwhelmed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so much to do. A little time. Okay, you know, it's really just, that's all just way too much fun. <laughs> Okay, so I know there's a lot crammed into two hours, but the only reason I crammed in so much in two hours is I know you have a video coming. So when you get that video, you can put it on and you can break it down into segments and you can try what I've taught you and you, you know, look at what I've taught you and then go try it. And then come back and look at it a little bit more and then go try it. And then do, you know, like that. And that's, you know, when I was, um, uh, looking at uh, Carlin Holman uh, videos. I don't know if you guys have heard of her, but she's, she does the spirit of spontaneity. She's passed away now, unfortunately, but she had uh, videos out. And when I was first learning to paint, I would do that. I would look at her videos and I'd run in my, you know, paint place and I would paint. And then I'd go look at some more and I'd go run in and paint. So I think that it will be less overwhelming once you do that. Because I know I threw a lot at you, but I just felt like, I wanted to show you all the techniques I'll and things it. that yeah. you could do. And I didn't want, and yeah, and, and I think that if, and like I said, if you didn't have the video, I would have condensed it. <laughs> Wanda? So, yes. Awesome. Wanda? Hi. Does it, um, does it wipe back to white pretty much? Um, yes, uh, for most things, but like anything else, there's like, those staining colors like the phthalo blues and that kind of thing, they'll stain a little more. But if you take Mr. Clean Magic Eraser, oh, that brings up a really important thing I wanna show you. Okay, I'm so glad you asked questions because then I remember these little brushes, these little quarter inch brushes with an angle on them are fabulous for lifting stuff out when you want just a, a small little line somewhere or you want, say you have a stencil and you want to lift out just a little bit of that stencil, you can go in there and lift it out with just this little brush. And this is on my supply list, this little brush. I just love this thing. I use it a lot for lifting out little shapes. Yeah, so. Where do you find your wonderful stencils? Because they're fabulous. I know, aren't they great? It's an Amazon. Yes. Yeah, uh -huh. I've got them on Amazon. And you just, once you find one, then you'll find tons. No more questions? I think they've got to think about it a bit. They're is probably this your preferred work. work now, is doing UFO paintings, or do you do other? Actually that's a good question too. I just, I'm all over the board with what I do. And I had actually gotten away from UPO for a long time, but I thought it's one thing that I can really teach because as an intuitive artist, you know, I mean, I've painted paintings with a, a, a man with a piano player in his head, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, Glory's laughing. <laughs> She's seen my stuff. And, you know, and, uh, you know, all kinds of things. I didn't know how at this point to teach that, but I can teach the UPO because it has definite steps and things that I can uh, show people. But in the process of doing those demos and workshops, I've become to love it again. So I may stick with it a while, but I, I journeyed off into doing just big things like a three and a half by five and a half feet um, canvas uh, with acrylic. So, yeah. Wow, that's you, a You're an excellent, yeah. excellent instructor. Very clear, your, your voice, your, your style, everything is just excellent. I really think you did a great job. Very Thank organized, you, step by step, yeah, nice. Thanks. Really nice. Thank, you. Thank you. Gloria, you're muted. I can't hear you. 
<laughs> I can see her over there. <laughs> Wanda, a quick technical question. Yeah. Are you using your camera phone? I'm using an iPad. And you're moving it all around like that? Yeah, it's on a stand. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's on a stand that has elbows. Yeah. Oh. You. Were you here in the beginning, the Jamie? No, I was playing tennis, sorry. Oh, <laughs> let me show you something, Jamie, because this will be on an iPad. Do you have an iPad? No, I have a, a laptop and a phone. Oh, never mind. I don't know yeah. if you can do it. But, but let me just show you if you can uh, on your iPad, I don't know. See, I can show, um, oh, there's Kuan Yin. I'll show you the one I was talking about. That's my Kuan Yin painting. So that's the one I just finished, the big one on canvas. But you can show photos. And then and, and on my um, iPad, I can, I have this little drawing tool. So I can draw okay. on there, indicate stuff, you know, that wow. kind of thing. Cool. Yeah, okay, and I don't you. know if you can have that, but that's, it is helpful. And then you have a whiteboard too, where you can do drawings. Wow. Okay, I have to get with it. Yeah. <laughs> Amy, I think it'd be good if you had two devices, one which you know, might be focused on your face when you're doing your right. intro stuff, and then later on one that's pointed at your art okay. surface. Well, I just ordered a uh, flexible thing to hold my uh, phone so I can face that down on my artwork and my computer. Yeah, I think the, um, in the iPhone, in your photo app, when you um, click, you want to edit. And then when you hit more, there's a markup tool where you pick oh, yeah. if you want a marker or a pencil and you can draw on your, um, okay. the photograph of your painting or whatever. Okay, thank you. Um, Jay, I, I've been taking classes from Drew Brandish. Mm -hmm. and he has a program I think Wanda is talking about for the iPad. Oh, right. I, think well, I don't want to get too technical. No, I'll have two it, devices like, no, like Ralph said. It makes life easier. Yeah. Wanda, but Drew's that was got it all set up in his bathroom. You said you were cramped. <laughs> Drew Brandish is working from his bathroom. Bathroom? <laughs> He's such, a, he's such a dear. I just love him. Oh, his, his classes are wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I've taken yeah. lessons from him too. Well, I'm yeah. going to take the Sterling Edwards class here at the end of September. So I'm anxious to see how he has it set up for two days. Yeah. Yeah. You might want to talk to Kathleen Scoggin too, Jamie, because she's so willing to share. She's so generous. Okay. But she could tell you how she managed it as well. Right. Because yeah, two days is a lot on Zoom. Well, yeah, for Sterling Edwards, but he must have it down, huh? I would yeah. think. Katie, oh, you have a he's question? only two days. Yeah, I have a question on uh, just for the iPad. I think Drew calls that it's an app called Paint. Is that what it was called? That you can do the drawing. Right. It's an app you just download. I think it's free. Well, I'm going to do old-fashioned watercolor paper with the camera <laughs> oh, over the top. No. No. <laughs> yeah. it's all old school. Come on, Jamie, go to you go. Get out off the water. <laughs> I had my U-boat for a while. I think we've really enjoyed this. This has been very, very enlightening to uh, a lot of us, I'm sure. And, yes. Uh, I've learned a lot and uh, hope everybody did. And I think we enjoyed ourselves. Excellent. Thank right. you very much. It was very, very fun. Good. Really good. enjoyed it. You're Thank welcome. You. Good. You're welcome. You're Excellent. Welcome. Thank you. Excellent, Thank you. excellent instruction. <laughs> What's that? Excellent instruction. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So yeah. Thank you for having together. We need to Pardon do me? this all together. Say it when, again. We, when we get together, you mean? Yeah, we yeah. should do a UFO fun class. It's just a fun experience together. Yeah, that would be great. I'll put yes. oh, so I'm not going to be teaching again for a while. I'm, I'm done for a little while, except next March, I'm going to be teaching at the Watercolor Society and March 20th and 21st, I believe, in a two-day uh, weekend class. And, um, you know, it's, it'll probably be on Zoom because, you know, I'm hoping that we'll be in person, but we'll see. Okay. Thanks again. Yeah, we'll all get You're lazy welcome. not want to drive anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ralph. Thank you, Ralph. Okay. Setting it up. Thanks for you. Yes, thanks very much, Ralph, for having me. Okay. Bonjour.
Oh, I have to turn this off. <laughs> Thank you.